really look at the macro trends in digital media as it applies specifically to your industry. We did a benchmark report really looking at how digital media is, how technology is, how social media is being used in the industry above and beyond marketing and branding. Four years ago, when I was at an AEM event, we were really talking about digital media for company awareness. Uh, how to integrate digital media with your marketing and branding strategies to drive sales and, again, awareness. Today, we are still talking about that, but we've advanced much further and really have found that there are opportunities to integrate digital media in almost every aspect of the supply chain and every aspect of your business, not just to drive marketing and awareness, but to drive efficiencies and bottom line productivities. So what we're gonna do today, as I mentioned, is look at those macro trends, but then really spend some time together looking for your opportunities or learning about, if you're already savvy, how you're using digital media today. I'm gonna leave you with a practical implementation strategy so that if you do hear anything today that you'd like to try on in your own organization, you're prepared and know how to tactically go and do that. And we'll close by talking about how to stay safe in the social sphere and in the digital sphere. I know uh, we spend a lot of time, uh, the individuals in this room spend a lot of time thinking about safety uh, and how to keep the people that are safe on your teams. Uh, so I wanna do that today too, but in the digital sphere. And we'll hop right in. Because you can tell that I'm shy and I don't like to share a lot about myself, I thought I'd start with a personal story. Uh, and uh, again, thank you all so much for coming to a session on digital media. Um, in 2011, the month before I broke my leg and came to my last AEM event, uh, I was feeling a little overwhelmed uh, from building a couple startups and, and maybe not going on a vacation in three years or so. So I told my husband, I call him Normal Neil, he's always very balanced, he's the exact opposite of you know, very balanced. I said, we gotta get out of here and go on a vacation. Like, clear your schedule right now, we're out of here. And three days later, we left for Kauai, a very small island uh, in Hawaii. We had a great couple first days, very relaxing, exactly what I was expecting. And the night prior uh, to our departure, we came up from the pool at about 9.30 p.m., and Anderson Cooper was on the TV talking about the horrible tsunami that was sweeping Sundai. And we could see in real time in Japan, mothers and daughters, do you guys remember this footage of the helicopters hovering over and moms and daughters? And I'm thinking, my gosh, I work in digital media. We're close enough to see these people and we can't save them. I've got goose guns, this is horrible. And I mentioned I had just come up from, from the jacuzzi uh, and wanted to rinse off. So I you know, went about my business not thinking, I'm in the middle of the ocean and these waves are coming here. So normal Neil, my overly calm husband, comes into the bathroom and says, hey hon, uh, Anderson Cooper just said this tsunami's coming to Kauai. And I said, coming or warning? What are you talking about? He said, no, it's coming. At about three in the morning, we're gonna be hit with waves. And what Anderson Cooper has said, that Kauai, the little unknown island of Kauai, will be the indicator for how large these wave strengths will be when they hit the US. It's coming. So I'm gonna take a nap, because I wanna be rested if we have to swim. I was like, what? And this guy laid down and went to sleep. Okay, so note, first exchange was Anderson Cooper on the TV. Second exchange was face to face with my husband. He lays down, starts snoring, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need information. I forgot to tell you two things. One, I am at the St. Regis Hotel, which is lovely, but if you've been there in Kauai, it is on the edge of the cliff looking at the ocean. And Anderson Cooper saying, if you're in Hawaii and you can see the ocean, you're too close, you've gotta go somewhere. Yeah, well, I have nowhere to go. Um, the other thing I forgot to tell you is I'm 37 and I'm really fortunate to have both of my grandmothers alive and well, one in Youngstown, Ohio, the other in Poughkeepsie, and I'm from Youngstown, by the way, I don't admit that often, but it seems appropriate here. Um, they're alive and well, and they make me call them every time I land, and they're gonna start freaking out as soon as they learn that I'm in Kauai, on the edge of the ocean with the tsunami coming. So I have to get more information before I call my grandmas and settle them down. So I go to websites, local websites, and start looking at what people are saying about the geography in Kauai. Where's the highest point? I go to blogs. 
where people are really giving safety instructions, locals that have been through things like this before. Um, I posted on Facebook to my brothers and sisters that I love them, which then caused mass panic because everybody thought that I was going to die. I guess I don't do that enough. Um, what finally really helped me to make a decision, other than calling a few people that were in the mainland that were giving me some good, accurate reports, is this blog said, hey, Carissa, didn't say my name, but I felt like it was speaking directly to me. The highest point in Kauai is the St. Regis. It's on a place called Queen's Bluff. If you can get to Queen's Bluff by 3 a.m., get there. It's the safest place that you can be. So other than requiring some wine that the hotel sent me when I was asking them at what point the helicopters would come to the golf course to remove us all, um, I made my decision and I called my grandmas and I told them, hey, there's a tsunami coming. You're going to see when you wake up, but it's going to be okay. I'm at the highest point. There's nowhere for us to go. We're going to be great. And long story short, it, it, we were so blessed, and, and we got an extra couple of days of vacation. All the roads were washed out. We were stuck there, and, and we were just fine. And our, our hearts and thoughts are obviously um, with the people that didn't have that experience in Japan. But here's the point for our story. I made my decision. That's literally me making my decision. Not just through one medium. Not through what Anderson Cooper told me. Oh, the, there's Anderson Cooper. That's David Beckham, not my husband, but this is my speech, so I just figured. Um, <laughs> not what my husband told me, not what the newspaper was saying, not what I learned on the phone, not what the blog said, but I made my decision through multiple different mediums. And I really can't tell you which medium was more important. And today, this is how our customers and our prospects are making decisions. They're using a million different mediums, starting sometimes with what we tell them face-to-face, -face, but oftentimes a customer today is 60% through the buying cycle by the time they talk to us for the first time because of all of these mediums that exist online and the amount of information that they can gather. It's changing the way that we make decisions. So I would like to challenge everyone in the room today to ask yourself how this evolution of communication and the way that people are making decisions and the amount of information that's readily available to them is impacting your industry, your personal role, your organization, and what opportunities it creates for us. So apologies for the long personal story, um, but truly it sets the stage for the way that we digest mediums today and make decisions, and I'd love for you to carry that with you uh, through the rest of our conversations and challenge yourself to really be accountable to communicating where your target audience is today. And if that's in seven different places, then I'm gonna challenge you to be in seven different places at once. But I'll give you some implementation and uh, tool techniques so that that doesn't sound overbearing before we leave. So, you know, the evolution of communication isn't new. If we think about this new digital media, and I was teasing you earlier with swear words like Facebook and Twitter, and you know, I don't say those words. I don't, I don't like to say that I'm in social media. Sure, I'm a social media practitioner, but what we're really talking about is just communication, the evolution of communication. We've seen this with all major mediums. We saw it with TV, we saw it with the internet, we saw it you know, with broadcasting long ago. It seems like as a new media is introduced and becomes really productive, it almost starts to cannibalize other aspects of the industry. This isn't new. It becomes its own industry. So that's really what we're seeing right now. Um, but again, the question is, what's the impact to you and what's it really mean? So let's have some fun. Who can define social media without using any of those swear words? How could you define social media if you're not allowed to say technology, you're not allowed to say online, you're not allowed to say LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, none of those words. I don't want to hear them. What is social media? Anyone willing to tolerate me? And by the way, I'm going to ask for two actors in just a couple minutes. So if anyone's feeling really bold, get ready because I need some help today. I can't do this on my own. I just can't. Internet, if you have to. Yes. Absolutely. So to get in touch with your friends and associates in a way that's really difficult to do in the real world. I mean, we can only talk to so many people a day face to face, but you can reach a lot of people and, and really hurdle geographic um, or even organizational borders. 
and break down silos in that way. Awesome. Anyone else have a good idea of what social media is if you're not allowed to use swear words? Interconnect people, awesome, very good. So we're really talking about communication. When I define social media, I really think of it as an open dialogue marketplace where there's been a shift and a reallocation of authority away from just companies or one individual that's an influencer that's speaking. That speaker does not like my voice there. Um, to, uh, to really a two-way dialogue where the individual has just as much authority as the brand and the ability to speak and speak loudly and reach a lot of people. We also find that people use social media for three main reasons. Um, and that tends to be for education, to seek for information or to learn about something, for entertainment, to connect with a friend, as you mentioned, maybe look at a picture of someone's new grandchild. Um, and then also for collaboration, to really work with others that are like them uh, or not like them and to collaborate and push ideas forward. And these are oftentimes the three reasons that we see people use social or digital media. The reason I take the time to share that with you is so that if you decide to use social media or are using it today in your business, you can think about how your customers or prospects or internal employees, if you want to use it internally, are using social media today, and then look to serve them content in one of those large umbrellas, education, collaboration, or entertainment. So I mentioned that we did a benchmark report on the state of social media uh, in the agricultural and um, manufacturing equipment industry. And we found some really interesting things. We found that today, digital media is being used to sell, to, as you mentioned, connect with people, both professionally and personally, um, but to connect with individuals pre-sale, post-sale, to increase the relationship, even increase the overall size of a, a contract. We're also seeing a ton of implementation and operation efficiencies. Um, we're looking at individuals uh, that may have a question about how to use something when it comes to training, for example, um, or a new customer that um, has a really exciting experience with a, a new tractor and, and wants to be able to talk about it. We're watching people implement digital um, to drive efficiencies in other areas as well. And one place that might really be relevant um, for a number of individuals in the room is recruitment. One of the things that people look for in digital media is humanism. They want to talk to other people. They don't really want to talk to a brand. Um, and they have the ability to talk to people, as we've just talked about, and they're demanding. So using that humanism, as we'll see in a case study that we'll look at in a little bit, in recruitment campaigns through social media, and it's an amazing way to meet new candidates, introduce them to your organization, and onboard them. Is anybody using social media in any ways, whether it be marketing and branding uh, or, or other business strategy ways that you want to share with us today to help put a little color to this benchmark study that we did? If not, that's okay. I'll pick on you in a minute. I can finally, I was, I can go Bueller, Bueller, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? I, I did this the other day. Nobody answered, and I went Bueller, Bueller, and I was at a university, and nobody knew what I was talking about. Everybody just stared at me, and I went, oh, wow. All right, <laughs> moving on. Anyway, um, so what this means, um, as we've just talked about, uh, is it's changing the way that we make decisions. Um, and it's really making an impact in a number of different areas of our business. In the research that we did, I just wanted to take a minute really quickly to walk you through some of what we found. Um, we found that uh, at a shop manager um, level, individuals are oftentimes using digital media for safety reasons, um, really to promote, whether it be via video or text, a lot of different um, safety initiatives, which is interesting to see. We also saw, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of prospecting and sales going on. And one thing that we just saw a ton of is training, both internal training and customer training. That seems to be a very strong trend in the industry um, with social and digital media. And we'll get further into all of this as we move on. 
kind of went ahead of myself a little bit earlier um, in talking about how digital media is changing the decision-making process, uh, but let's elaborate just a little bit. Anyone here used to make cold calls? I made cold calls for like 15 years on the phone, right? Prospect never heard of you. Hi, my name's Carissa. I know I caught you off guard. May I please have one minute of your time? Here's your pain point. Here's how I can help you. Can I have an appointment to come in? No. All right, well, you have to say no five times before you're going to say yes. I know that no is just an objection for more information, so let me tell you more. Remember that? That was fun. Um, I still think there's a place for cold calling. I know a lot of people don't, but I don't think that cold calling's dead. It's just that today, oftentimes, by the time we make that cold call, again, the individual has been through so much of this decision-making process that they're much further ahead, and our scripts have to change a little bit because we're hopping in 60% through the sales process. Um, but we're finding that when someone thinks to themselves, gosh, I need to buy something new, or I need this piece of equipment for my farm, they immediately do what? What's the first thing they do? One of two things. That's, that is like 90% of people Google it first, and if they don't Google it, what's, what's a traditional person do? Ask. Ask a buddy. That's right. It's word of mouth in Google. And this is, thank you, you feel like that was like perfect, like I planted it for you. Um, this new decision-making process is even changing word of mouth. So what we find is one of two things happen, but it all leads back to Google. I really need to buy something new. I'm not going to call my salesperson or, or somebody. That, I'm going to go to Google. Then I'll have the information that I know. Or I'm going to ask my buddy, and then I'm going to take whatever he told me to Google and see if he's right and see what other people said. Because word of mouth is even changing by all of this information that we have. 97% of people, even when it's just over a restaurant, won't take your word of mouth anymore. Even your best friend will go and Google and see what other people are saying about the restaurant that you just suggested on Yelp or something like that before they make a decision to eat. The same thing is happening in the buying process, and we really need to think about how that changes our business orientation as we're approaching customers and prospects. But as I mentioned, cold calling's not dead. I'll prove it. I'll cold call one of you. I, I'm not sure what I'm selling, but I'll, I'll figure, give me something to sell, and I'll cold call one of you, and we'll prove that it's not dead. The real key to integrating digital media is in integration. You don't want to replace what you're doing today that works well for you. Rather, you want to think of, and I wish I had a whiteboard, you want to think of an intersection of where there's either opportunity for your company to improve or where there's just something that you do great and an interest of your audience if that makes sense. Um, that's a good place to implement digital media. So I'll work to color that a little bit more. If you are really, really strong in training and safety information, and you're just best to breed when it comes to that, putting that information into digital tidbits to be digested in the areas where your customers, um, prospects or even employees are today so that they can get all of that great information that you have is a really smart place um, to start. So again, you want to look for either opportunities or gaps in your business, and then you want to match that intersection point with an interest of your audience. And that can help tell you what your digital strategy should be or where there's opportunity um, in your business. But again, the key is integration. You know, I'll say if you take one thing away, other than the fact I'm a little crazy and have a lot of energy from today, um, please take away this statement. The most important aspect of what you do in the digital sphere are the results it drives offline. So I'll say it one more time. The most important aspect of what you do in the digital sphere, call it social sphere if you want to simplify it, is the impact it makes offline in your business. That's why we spend time online. We spend time online to make a bottom line impact in our business offline. Otherwise, it's useless, and, and we're literally Twittering our lives away and Facebooking away, and all those bad words come back. So you really want to be strategic about where you see the opportunity. And again, that's either a strength or a gap in your business, and you want to match it with the interests of your audience. And the reason I say audience is because it's easy to talk about customers and prospects, but I know that you have a lot of individuals that comprise different segments of your audience. Um, and so you may be saying, I really have a communication struggle internally at my organization, and I could see a way to implement an internal 
uh, system that allowed individuals to share voices across silos and so forth. And in that case, your audience would be your internal employee. But this is a formula that will help you identify if there's an opportunity to integrate. So if, I guess this is what I'm selling you. I'm selling you that this can impact your bottom line. Um, if you're buying what I'm selling, uh, I'd love to spend just a tiny bit of time talking about how you can implement it. And this is where I warned you I need help because it's hard to implement big strategies on your own. I need two people to come help me implement. Uh, and I'm just gonna ask you to do some impromptu acting. It's super easy, it's super fun. You'll make me so happy. Um, but is it possible that two individuals are feeling uh, confident today and wanna come up on stage and help me out? And I'll give you a little hint. At Team Media, uh, we've created a three-step strategy that allows you to implement in the way that we've been discussing. And I'm just gonna have you guys help act it out. It's super easy. I'll go downstairs and buy Starbucks cards and bribe someone if I have to. I'm not above bribery. <laughs> Please, two takers. I was told everyone was engaged. Yeah, awesome. All right, Listen, how much have you heard me talk? I can play two people if I need to, but you don't wanna see my split personalities. Thank you, sir, I'm Carissa. Chance, Chance? awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right, I need one more rock star. Anybody, anybody, come on, come on. And then I need literally 30 seconds with my actors to get them ready. Don't make me do it by myself. Well, I'm gonna have to play two roles. That's gonna be hard. All right, guys, come on, one more person. One more person, you guys can do it, it's so easy. Come on, come on, come on. Please don't make me beg. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you. Awesome, awesome. Jason, I'm Carissa. All right, can you turn this off for literally 30 seconds? Is that possible? I'm ready to roll. I don't even know if I was ever on mic. I'm gonna grab both of you gentlemen microphones. And we are ready to roll. You guys wanna do it there? You wanna come up on the stage, it's up to you. You can even sit if you're more comfortable, whatever, you, whatever your preference is. Your chance, your chance. And thank you guys so much. Can I have a round of applause for my actors? All right, so here's the stage. We are at an at an AEM networking event. That's it. All right, ready? Actors, act. So uh, I'm guessing you went to the AEM TV dinner last night? Actually, I didn't. Uh, my group decided to go to Southern Kilt last night and get some wings and some burgers. It was pretty good. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we went to Johnny's last night, and uh, I had some, I call it chicken fried veal because, uh, you know, they smash it and bread it. It was actually really good. Man, that sounds good. I've tried Oh, it. hi, guys. My name's Carissa. You're here with AEM. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just got the skirt, and it's running already. Can you believe this? This is so crazy. I mean, do you, do you ever shop at Banana Republic? I mean, can you believe this? This is insane. I'm sorry. What, what's your name? Uh, I'm, I'm Chance. Oh, so nice to meet you. And you? Uh, Jason. Oh, good. Well, anyways, nice to meet you guys. Check you later. Bye. Anyway, All so right, yeah, back to what we're talking about. <laughs> All right. So round of applause. What just happened? Why weren't they interested in me at all? They were not interested in what I was talking about. I was not serving up value-based relevant content, fair enough? Um, but, but truly, um, they didn't accept me into their conversation because I was a stranger. I barged in, I didn't introduce myself or shake my hand first, or shake their hand first, rather, shake my own hand first. Um, and I didn't ask what they were talking about or listen first to know what the topic of the conversation was. I just started creating content about something my audience truly didn't care about. I can't tell you how often we do this in the digital sphere. You guys aren't off the hook yet. You know you got one more round. Um, we do this all the time in the digital sphere. We're like, I got a great idea for a social media campaign. And then we spend all this fancy money building it, and then we serve it to our audience, and they're like, what in the world is this person talking about? I've never heard of them. They didn't introduce themselves. Why are they wasting my time? And it feels like spam. So let's look at how implementation can go 
if we if we do it properly. All right, actors, you ready for round two? It was pretty good last time. I was trying not to stop it, but I know I only get 45 minutes. Actors, act. So anyway, we went to the AMP uh, dinner last night, and it was kind of cool, you know. I didn't expect it to go that way, but we all got together and talked a lot about business. So. Yeah, met some new people. Yeah, definitely. Great, great food. Yeah. yeah, really good food. Yeah, Oktoberfest was good. Yeah. Down good. Well, and then there was a little bar right around the corner from the, the place, so oh, you know, yeah. we got Hi, to mingle gentlemen. with it. I'm so sorry to interrupt. My name is Carissa. Hi, Carissa. Nice to meet you. Hi, Carissa. I'm Jason. Jason, such a pleasure. I um, just overheard you talking. You're here with AEM? A- yeah, actually AEMP and, you know, but AEM as well. AM and AMP, excellent. And um, you uh, you were at the dinner last night. Yeah, uh, we uh, you know we all met at the uh, Bar Louis, and you know they passed out oh, cards, Bar so we got Louis. to randomly go with different people. How fun! I bet that was a really productive exercise. It, I've it heard was. of Bar Louis; it's supposed to be really nice. Are y'all headed back that way tonight? Oh, we probably will. I imagine heading home. <laughs> heading home. That'd be lovely. Um, excellent, excellent. Well, I'm so glad that it was uh, productive, and I know I missed last night, but maybe we can exchange business cards, too, and keep in touch in the future. Definitely. Yeah, That'd be you. excellent. So nice to meet you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, round of applause for our actors. All right, you guys are in the clear. I'll take them. Don't worry. Thank you guys so much. Seriously, you guys rocked it. You guys are very good actors. That's like off the cuff with little preparation. Um, a sincere, sincere thank you, because as you can see, it's very hard to play all three of those roles, although I've had to do it in the past. Um, so what happened the second time? This isn't brain surgery now. I was trying to get an invite to Bar Louie, but everyone was going home, so that didn't quite work out, but I got close. Um, what happened? Other than lurking and looking very strange behind them while I was picking up what they were talking about, I did. I got an introduction. You know what else I did? Lost my remote for the slides. I got an introduction. I allowed them to realize that I was on the same platform or part of the same community AEMP, AEM, I'm here with you. Um, And also, I asked them what they were talking about, learned more about the subject matter before I started generating any content or suggesting anything. So this is a really simple three-step process that works in the social sphere. It's called listen, participate, and create. And so oftentimes we skip listening and participating and just start creating And that's when we get that social media campaign that's like a banana republic hem. Nobody cares about it. They don't don't even know what you're talking about or why you interrupted them. So I oftentimes get the question, what do you mean by listening in the social sphere? I can't hear what people are saying. I saw you being all creepy up here and listening, but how do you do that? What we're really talking about is listening on different platforms to your customers, to your employees, to your prospects, And you want to listen for a few different things. You want to listen first to who they are. Who is it that's talking about things that are important in your industry? Perhaps you might find a whole audience you didn't even know you had. And then, of course, you want to listen for what are they talking about? What are the subject matters that are of interest to them? And remember those categories, education, collaboration, entertainment. If you can help to kind of keep notes on this This audience really likes to be entertained. Friday funnies might be great for them. Or this audience really likes to digest information. They're big learners. I'm going to do a thought leadership campaign for this audience and really teach them a lot. Um, And then, of course, what platforms are they on? Not everybody is on Facebook. Not everybody is on Twitter. Um, Most people are on some form of digital media today, but it's important to listen for where your specific audience is and then spend your time on those platforms so that you're connecting and making that match. Anyone using Google Alerts today, just in business? Yeah, every, awesome. So start using it for your social media listening too. Type in a couple terms there that allow you to um, listen to, to social boards and, and catch the chatter. It's a great, easy way to have that dialogue delivered to you so you know what's going on and you don't have to take the time to go out and search. Um, next is the participation piece. So there's two things about participation. One, I mean, think about the understanding that you get from your audience just by listening. That's great. But the ability to participate and ask questions, just like in a real conversation, deepens that learning and helps you figure out in the even, uh, I guess, in a targeted capacity, if you will, um, how you're going to serve content when you're, when you're ready to do that. So that's the first thing that happens in participation. It's that deeper learning. The second thing that happens, though, is really important. You build credibility in the community that you're gonna start creating and delivering content in. 
just like in a regular community, you know, I moved somewhere new. So I moved um, from Vancouver, British Columbia, to Westchester, New York about three years ago. And when I moved and started meeting new people in the community, I introduced myself, I explained who I was, and then through a series of interactions demonstrated who I was over the course of the last three years. And now I'm integrated in that community and I have a persona and people understand what to expect from me. But that didn't happen by showing up and saying, hi, I'm Carissa McClusack and I'm part of Westchester now. Um, there's a process that goes in there and the same is true online. So a great way to start participating and building that credibility um, is using LinkedIn, uh, joining a LinkedIn group where discussions are happening and just joining the ongoing discussions rather than originating them is a great way to become part of the community that you want to lead long term to build that credibility, establish those relationships. And then that way, when I say, oh, hey, I'm Chris, I just moved to Westchester. Want to come over for dinner? You're like, uh, oh, actually, wait, I know you. That's a warm lead. You live right at the, t yes, I'd love to, versus just a complete stranger saying, hey, come to my Facebook page, come to my LinkedIn page, it's great. They're like, I'm sorry, we haven't shaken hands yet, no. Um, but right, you'd come over for dinner. So that participation piece is really critical. And then, of course, the last piece is create. And the only rule with creation is you have to make sure it's value-based. I know I've said that a few times, and I'll pause just to, to drill it in. Value-based really means that your audience is going to be interested in digesting it. It's aligned with what they care about. Um, and it may not create value if you're working to sell a prospect a, a new piece of equipment, let's say. The value-based content may not work to push that sale directly down the line. It may not say, hey, are you ready to buy today? I'm offering you 10% off. That's not a good way to, to sell in social media. What it will likely do is educate the individual that's making the purchasing decision um, about aspects of the industry or aspects of the decision and help to serve them the information that they need to make the decision. Because then as they start to make the decision, they think, where did I get this information from? Oh, I got it from this organization. I feel very comfortable with that organization. They have a lot of credibility. I've been participating with them, and it's easier to make that purchase, if that makes sense. Um, so how can you create? You can create by posting something. You can create by creating a YouTube video. Or you can get really serious about a thought leadership campaign and map out topics for the next month, for the next year, um, to share with segments of your audience. Any questions on listen, participate, create? I feel like when you see it in skit form, Jason and Chase did it perfectly. Jason and Chase did a great job. Um, you, uh, it's, it's really simple. It, it's just like having a conversation offline. The same way that we would all approach each other and meet each other is really the right approach online as well. All right, good deal. So if you're going to do this, um, I guess we've already talked about this a little bit. I think we'll move right into case studies. But if you're going to do this, it's important to decide what you're going to be. And I just bring this up because um, I know how busy we all are in the room. I'm so pleased that you took the time to be here this morning. And bandwidth is a real question. So it's great if you love all these things, but how are you going to have you know, 20 hours a day to do it? You really have to decide who you're going to be um, in the digital sphere. You don't have to be everything to everyone. But if there is one group in your audience that you feel maybe you don't connect with enough, Maybe you put your initiatives there and really decide to connect with that group, you know, here as it's saying in a one-to-many capacity. Or maybe you decide, you know what, I'm not really ready to lead with thought leadership, but I want to create a platform where all my customers or all my employees can connect and collaborate. So I'm just going to host that dialogue and ask other people to talk, if you will. That's a one-to-one a, a -one or a many-to-many -many strategy where you're hosting. Um, but you can decide. You don't have to do it all. So let's look at just how a few, uh, and maybe there's people from these companies in the room, that would be fun. Um, a few organizations are, are putting this uh, into practice. Um, first, let's look at a big brand that everybody knows. Is anybody from Agco here? No, okay. Um, there are a couple different things here that I would like to point out. And if you wanna take any homework away from our session today, um, Google the two companies we're gonna look at so you could get a feel for what I'm talking about. There's really four things going on with this brand that are really interesting in the social sphere. The first is um, Echo went out and really focused on building a parent 
almost like a grandfather brand because what they found was that some of their larger customers that may be able to benefit from products in different lines had no idea that they had opportunities um, for them uh, with another piece of equipment, so to speak. So they're looking to share goodwill or trust um, across their different lines. That's one thing that they have done that's, that's very interesting, and they allow customers um, to help increase that trust across lines. So there's one premise that exists, which is in the social sphere, the trust that exists between user to user, you and I, is so much stronger than the trust that a brand can create with the user. Because we want to talk to people and we believe other, I believe what you say, not what the brand says. Um, so if I can leverage what my customers are saying about me and put that in front of other customers, that's, that's the strongest marketing that I can do. That's better than any testament I can create as a brand. And that's what we see going on here a lot. Now, at the same time that I'm saying they did a great job unifying a brand, they're also leveraging something that we call the power of segmentation in social media. In social media, um, you know, your definition was a, a good jumping stone for this. We're able to reach so many people in such a vast capacity. Um, one of the benefits is that is we can also really segment them into very specific audience groups and then serve those audience groups different content. So for example, with Agco here, what's going on in Zimbabwe on a farm may be very different than what's going on in Denmark. And they don't want to talk to these two customers in the same way. So they've done a great job of segmenting and then serving different content pieces to different audience members. Um, it's a bit of an advanced strategy, but you could do it, you could, you could you know, have one communication plan for your employees, one for your customers, so on and so forth. Um, outside of the industry, Dell is another company that does this very well. If you just want to see the power of segmentation in play, they literally have social channels for every product they come out with, and um, it's been wildly productive for them. There's two other things that I wanted to mention here. One is thought leadership. Um, they're really doing an excellent job selling by using thought leadership. They put out a tillage report or tillage tips um, often, and it seems to be wildly popular, uh, and they're oftentimes doing so via videos or showcasing customers um, on, a, on a piece of equipment on their farm. So just some tips there on, on and, and it's really increased sales. Aside from the numbers, like they have 45,000 Facebook members and all that kind of stuff. Remember, the most important aspect of what you build online is what it does offline. I'm more interested in how it's transpired into sales and a bottom line impact. And it seems like specifically that goodwill across lines has been very productive. Um, but I always like to look at case studies from organizations of different sizes. Is anyone here from RDO Equipment Company? No? Too bad. Um, doing just as awesome of a job um, as Echo is, and there's a couple things going on here. One on the left, this is an amazing recruitment video where they're really leveraging humanism to talk about what it feels like to be part of the team. And apparently, uh, this strategy has been wildly productive in not just, interested, you know, not just getting more candidates interested in the organization, but in actually reaching a larger candidate pool that they didn't realize was out there with a relevant skill set for them um, because some of the ways that they were advertising their recruitment campaign, they weren't reaching these people because the people weren't on the other end of that medium. They were somewhere else, maybe in the digital sphere. Uh, so oftentimes what you find is that by going into the digital sphere and integrating what you're already doing, you actually tap into a larger audience because now you're pooling people that are both offline and online. The other thing that's going on here um, again, is they're taking videos uh, of customers using different pieces of equipment, but this was a really interesting campaign and something that almost would freak me out as the owner of this company. I think it's fantastic that they did this. They allowed individuals to record in real time and upload their reaction to a new product. Um, that's scary to me, because what if you got negative comments um, or positive comments, but they were really open and really transparent, um, and it was very productive for them, and it leads into what we want to talk about next, which is if you're going to do things like this, you are opening yourself up for negative comments and criticism. And just as it's important to be safe um, and cautious in your business offline, it's important to be safe and cautious here as well. Uh, so I just want to leave you with a few ABCs of safety uh, in the social sphere. 
But before we do that, is there anything that we haven't talked about today that you wish we would? Um, any questions or comments from anything that we've covered so far? I would so much rather achieve what you want to achieve in the room than make it through my slide deck if there's anything that's just remiss in what we've discussed today. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, so I'm just doing a check. Okay. We're on the right track then? Did I take that as a, can I interpret that as we're on the right track? All right, that's how I'll interpret it. Thank you for those couple head shakes. I like it, I like it. All right, so this stuff's important. This is the nitty gritty. I won't spend too much time here, but it is really critical. Um, and before we hop into the do's and don'ts, I just wanna point out, and I'm sorry I keep picking on you for your definition. You didn't realize how good it was. Um, but there is a very fine line between who you are personally and professionally in the social sphere. Um, the very first definition we heard was to connect with professional people, friends, family, so on and so forth. This is not a lecture on don't swear on Facebook. To each his own. You do whatever you like on Facebook. This is really about helping to um, open up your awareness uh, about the impact that you make online for your company. Remember, people are really looking for humanism and transparency in the social sphere. So when you're there as a person and your company name is attached to you, it is impossible to separate who you are as a person or what you do online from the impact that you make on your organization. And that's oftentimes very positive because we conduct ourselves the same way that we would online, offline. Um, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in being polite offline. I'm very interested in being polite online. Those things translate, so it's okay. But think of this almost as an additional search engine optimization opportunity for your company. When you put yourself out there and you describe yourself in the way that your customers want to hear, when they Google, they don't just find their company, they find you also. And you really can create an influence for your brand. So just think about that. Also completely irrelevant to what we're talking about today. I, uh, and Anderson Cooper comes up twice, which is random. On uh, Tuesday night, I saw a special on CNN about um, children. And did anyone else see this? Children in the internet, they followed 250 sixth graders. Uh, and at a sixth grade level, there is no difference between the way a child perceives the real world and the online world. That scares me. <laughs> um, but what Anderson Cooper was saying, it's literally one and the same to them. It's very difficult for them to separate that line and tell you where something started. Did it start in the real world or did it start online and, and how did it translate? So just think about that blurring line. It's gonna continue to blur um, and, and fortunately it, it can be very positive. So here are the, the quick don'ts and do's. I bet that you could guess that I'm gonna tell you to think about the way that you conduct yourself offline and do the same thing online. Um, but of course, and I apologize, this seems like it's a little difficult to see. Oh no, it's okay over here. Um, we never wanna post any confidential or propriety, you know, proprietary information, obviously. Um, we wanna be very careful, and this is easy to do by mistake in the online sphere, about infringing on anybody's um, copyright uh, or trademark, trademark content. You know when you see people reposting and retweeting all the time? It's that at sign where they're giving credit to where the post came from that's really important if you're gonna share content. That's actually a legal protection uh, for the individual that's sharing the content. So it's great, that's called co-creation. We talked about creating your own content from scratch, film a customer or have a customer film themselves, uh, you know, create something from your organization, but co-creating taking content from other organizations in the space and sharing it is a great practice too. They love it. You just want to make sure you use that at sign to indicate where it originated. Um, so those are really don'ts. Um, of course, you, you, know, you don't want to post anything that's uh, negative about the organization or anything that is internal information. I mean, that's pretty basic. Um, if I could share, again, two words, it's really about um, transparency and honesty. Um, that doesn't mean that if you have a bad quarter, you have to go post in the digital sphere, oh my gosh, we just had the worst quarter ever, I just wanna be transparent and honest. Um, what transparency and honesty means in the digital sphere uh, is really just answering questions to the best that you can, uh, whether they're positive or negative, um, in, a, in a polite and transparent tone. So sharing what you can. Um, 
There's also just a couple do's in terms of staying safe. Uh, you do always want to be polite, of course. We don't need to talk about that. Um, the two that I want to talk about are just respecting the rules of the platform that you're in and then adjusting your cultural norms to that platform as well. Um, so remember we talked about you don't have to be on every platform in the world, but you might want to be on Facebook if your audience is on Facebook, or you might want to be on LinkedIn if your audience is on LinkedIn. It's important to change the way that you're talking and presenting information for the cultural norms. And I bet you're all already pros in this. If I'm going to Twitter, how am I going to present information? It's going to be short, informal, right? Because you can only write 140 characters. I might have a picture. I'm probably going to use slang or dashes. I'm not going to be very formal in my presentation. But if I'm on LinkedIn answering a question in a group, I'm probably going to have a very professional tone and maybe even lead a link to a third party or an article that supports what I'm talking about because that's a much different climate, if that makes sense. So just think about where you're talking and just as you would in real life, um, adjust your cultural norms uh, to what you're speaking about as well. Oh, cool. I can click here as well. So what if somebody does say something bad? Has anyone ever had this happen in social media? <laughs> good. That's good. But it happens. Got it. What if somebody says something negative? First of all, that's okay. People say negative things. And remember that transparency and humanism is two, are two of the values, rather, that your audiences are looking to your company for. And, and this really just gives you an opportunity, if you're willing to respond and be transparent, to say, hey, I'm listening. I take customer feedback. I heard you. And I'm a human. And I'm going to answer the questions. Um, now, with that in mind, there are a couple rules to answering a negative response. One, you want to be timely. That's a tough thing to define in the social sphere because people think timely means now, 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 now. When I say timely, you really just want to respond to that person faster in the social sphere than you would through a more traditional channel. So if it would take you three days to call that customer back if they left you a message, you want to have it take one day to get back to them in the social sphere because their expectation is that it's going to be in real time or faster than traditional mediums to reach you. So you do want to be timely because people normally say something um, rude or negative when they're mad and heated. So we want to get to the person quick. Um, the other thing is, of course, being positive, polite. But there's one time when you have to be tough on someone that's negative, and that's if they post something that's inaccurate. If someone posts something that's just blatantly inaccurate about your organization, you do not have to say thank you so much for posting that. I hear you. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Um, certainly, you should thank them for being interested in your organization and taking the time to create content about you. But then I would say you'll be pleased to know that's actually and factual. Here are the facts. And then it's great to leave a link to support whatever you're saying. So again, the only time that I would really correct somebody in the social sphere is if they post something that's just inaccurate about my company. This company doesn't even carry this product, can you believe it? And you do, it's actually one of your best lines. If you don't correct that, anyone else that comes to the sphere will take that as fact. So that's when it's really important to make sure that something's accurate. If a conversation's getting heated, just as if you were standing in a conference room with 30 people and a personal, con not that we're gonna get into it, don't worry, but a personal conversation got heated, I might say, hey, why don't we step out into the hall and finish that? Same thing you want to do on, on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram if there's a negative comment. You can start the conversation, but if it's not satiated quickly, you want to invite that person to a traditional communication medium to finish the conversation where it's not so visible. And most of the time, people really appreciate that. So negative responses aren't always bad. But people, we just talked about all this, so don't worry about it. Um, if, if, does anyone want me to leave this up for just a second? This is what we were just talking through, but this is just a nice bulleted out piece. I'm good to move on? Good. All note takers are done. I'm a note taker, so I'm always extra sensitive to note takers. Um, one of the last pieces that I'll talk about today is it's also really important to capitalize on positive responses. We spend so much time in the digital sphere worrying about what if someone says something bad and how are we going to respond? It happens very rarely. But so often, people are saying really great positive things about our brand, and we're like, oh, that was really cool.
but we don't do anything about it. And remember that trust that exists from user to user is so strong, highlighting someone's positive comment and saying, wow, thank you so much. I'm gonna share this on every channel. I love that you took the time to tell us that. Again, it's some of the strongest sentiment marketing that you can provide for your organization because it's not coming from you as the brand, it's coming from someone that had a customer experience that won. So you always wanna highlight positive comments as well um, and help to leverage them uh, for, uh, for brand share, why not? Um, and there's one final concept that I'll leave you with in uh, social and digital media, which is called a social influencer. An influencer in social media is somebody that talks about your company quite a bit and has a large following. Obviously, they can make quite an impact on your brand. So when you're looking at negative and positive comments and figuring out how much effort you need to put into a response, you really wanna figure out if the person is an influencer in your industry or not. And if they are, by putting effort into connecting with that individual and co-creating or chatting with them, you're gonna reach a very large audience through them, if that makes sense. So you always wanna look through these influencers. And in your industry specifically, there are a lot of thought leaders um, that are individuals that simply share great information and, and teaming up with such influencers can be a great way to to drive uh, sales, customer service, whatever it may be. So just as a quick insurance blanket, um, there are a lot of tools that you can use to help automate some of this. Does anybody use Hootsuite today? Cool. All right, great. There is a company, and I have no affiliation with them, I met the owner once, so not a, not a sales plug, called Hootsuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E.com. They have a, a paid version. There's also a free light version. If you're gonna start doing digital and social media work, think about, um, think about signing up for Hootsuite. What it is, is it's a social media aggregator. So it takes in everything that's being said about you on all your channels, puts it in one place where you can see it, and then builds analytics around it. So you literally have analytics telling you where people came from, how many times they engaged, so on and so forth. And everything's on one nice platform. So you've got Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all right there on one screen. The other thing that you can do on Hootsuite for free is post content to more than one platform, which is such a time saver. You know, if you just think, like a customer says something great and you say, I'm gonna leverage that across all my platforms, then you're like, oh my gosh, I have to literally copy and paste this in seven different places. You don't, you can just ping it out on Hootsuite and you can even stack Hootsuite to send messages out while you're sleeping. And it will just at you know, 1.29 a.m. send the video that you told it to send at that time. Um, so there are tools in the digital sphere that make using social media for business productive. And if you'd like to try on any of these strategies that we've talked about, I, I call it the executive plan. Um, listen, participate, create, five minutes each a day. So coming in the office, reading the paper, having your coffee, getting set up with everything that's going on, listen, in the social sphere for five minutes to your customers, to your prospects, to your employees, find out what's important to them. Later in the day, when you get back from client lunch, something like that, hop onto LinkedIn and for one second participate in one conversation. You don't even have to spend five minutes, spend three. But now you're participating, getting that deeper learning and building that credibility. And then at the end of the day, before you head home or once you're home, share one thing that you learned that was interesting that day with your audience and you're doing it. That's it. You're literally building a campaign. So after I stood up here and told you that this was all so important, you know, what we're really talking about is just like with any business strategy, you have to identify why you're doing it. Am I doing this to drive sales? Am I doing this to increase my candidate pool when it comes to recruitment? Am I doing this to increase my visibility and safety training with my customers? Why am I doing this? What's the strategy? And then you have to ask yourself, how do I define success? How will I know if what I'm doing is working? And remember, that success is gonna be offline. This is working if I sell two more pieces of equipment than I did last month as a result of what I'm doing online. That means it's working, and we can measure that. This is working for recruitment if I talk to seven people that I had never met and made two hires in two weeks when it normally takes me eight weeks. That's working. So just like with any business strategy, define what your success criteria are and then measure it. And if it's not working, stop doing it and look for that opportunity in that intersection somewhere else. So after all that, is it really that different? The evolution of communication. We started 
at Caveman's, ooga, 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 right? And we went all through all of this, old English, TV, and now we're back to Twitter, ooga, 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 and that's it. We're right back where we started. So I tease you, um, but uh, I leave you with a huge thanks and the definition of one last word, um, transmedia. Uh, Mike was kind to mention earlier that um, my firm is called T-Media. The T in T-Media stands for transmedia. And what transmedia is, is the art of using multiple mediums to tell a story and serve your client or audience base. And if you can accept that, it doesn't matter what the next iteration of communication is. I mean, for all I know, we're going to be staring at some screen and it's going to translate what I'm thinking and tell you. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just another avenue in your transmedia strategy to share your business success, your thought leaderships, your opportunities, and to connect with your audiences. So with that, I will finally stop talking and uh, ask you if you have any questions or comments. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to my actors. I really appreciate it.